It hasn't all been spectacular successes in the hedge fund industry, mind you. There have been some truly spectacular disasters. For instance, Victor Niederhofer mentioned in the last video clip had his fund destroyed by speculative bets on Thai banks during the Asian currency crisis in 1997 and lost nearly 75% of all of the assets he had under management. Julian Robertson's Tiger management firm bet against tech stocks in both 1997 and 1998 and lost $2 billion in a single day betting against the Japanese yen. That same year, long-term capital management took losses of almost $4 billion when Russia defaulted on its debts, um, but the firm continued to obey their computer models, which encouraged them to hold on to their positions on the premise that the correlations, historical correlations, uh, would <clears throat> ultimately win out. They did not, and LTCM closed its doors. Even more spectacularly, Amaranth Advisors lost $5 billion in a single week in 2006, attempting to corner the natural gas market and ultimately failing. Not to be outdone, Renaissance Technologies, the world's best hedge fund, managed to see their leading institutional funds lose 1931 and 32% respectively in 2020, telling their investors that their algorithms were thrown out of whack by market uh, swings. Meanwhile, their employee-only medallion fund made a 76% return the same year. <clears throat> now, overall, the hedge fund industry has not nearly been as successful recently as it has been in its glorious past, and perhaps it was a, a <clears throat> defeated by its own success. Following on the glorious successes of the 80s and 90s in the hedge fund space, <clears throat> asset managers began to become particularly interested notably pension funds and endowment funds, at the idea of having low correlation and high quality returns. So many people, uh, institutions, began to shop around for potential investments in the hedge fund space. And this led to massive proliferation in the hedge fund space of people trying to catch a little bit of that giant institutional money for themselves. Back in 1990, there were roughly $39 billion allocated to approximately 500 hedge funds around the entire world. By 2018, we are looking at closer to $3.2 trillion in the hedge fund space, being administered by roughly 10,000 different funds calling themselves hedge funds or alternative asset managers. Now, <clears throat> as you might imagine, the more and more crowded this space has become, the lower the economic profits have been for those people who are trying to participate in it. It's one thing when there are 500 hedge funds around the world, and many of them have got different kinds of strategies. But once there are 10,000 hedge funds on the dance floor, they can't help but dance on one another's toes. And as a result, the average performance of the entire space has suffered dramatically uh, since the mid-1990s. In fact, just looking at this basic data set from 2004 through 2019, you can see in green the fantastic performance of a simple indexed fund portfolio that is 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Compare that against the uh, returns on a hedge fund index uh, published by HFRI, uh, having only earned roughly a 50% return over 15 years compared with the broader market, which had more than 150% return during that time. Effectively, hedge funds on an after-fee basis have been almost trading sideways for the last decade and a half, with lots of managers getting rich off of the generous fee structure <clears throat> and many others trying to force their way into the market by trying to cut away at these fees or accepting high watermarks. Needless to say, the institutional investors have become a little bit less than impressed, and we've seen substantial amounts of money flowing back out of the hedge fund industry uh, in the late, uh, as we move into the 2020s. One area in particular where this has become problematic are is in high flying funds who have tried to maintain their return on assets by effectively breaking the rules of the market. And in particular, Raj Rajan Nathan of Galleon Group was found guilty of 14 charges of insider trading uh, and is still serving 11 years in jail. He should be getting released in the next year or two. On a much larger scale than that, though, SAC Capital Partners and, their, and its boss, Stevie Cohen, immortalized in the, series, uh, the TV series Billions, uh, was once an industry superstar, and people couldn't understand how SAC Capital Partners had been so consistently successful. Well, it turns out in 2013 that there was a massive insider trading scandal that was revealed with SAC Capital Partners at its heart. 
one of the judge overseeing the case was quoted as saying that substantial pervasive uh, and or sorry that insider trading by SAC was substantial pervasive and on a scale without known precedent in the hedge fund industry. SAC ultimately ended up settling out for $1.8 billion in fines, and its boss, Stevie Cohen, was banned from managing money until 2018. Suffice to say, the glorious days of the 1980s and 90s with high-flying hedge fund managers operating in a relatively uncompetitive space has now largely been replaced with copycats who cannot achieve the kinds of results that were seen in the past without, it seems, breaking the rules. It may entirely be time for a rethink in this particular space, as the low-hanging fruit has definitely been picked, and yet the industry still seems fixated on a notion of high fee structures that ultimately benefit the managers more than the investors.